Hi there, my dear students. This is Mom Heidi Kabasan, and welcome to our purposive communication class. Today, we're going to learn about communication, its processes, and principles. So first, we will be learning about what is communication. Simply put, because we want to be as simple as possible, we want to keep it as simple as possible, communication is defined as the art of transmitting information, ideas, attitudes from one person to another. Communication is the process of meaningful interaction. So I hope that is clear enough for you. Next, why do we communicate? Why do you talk? Why do you call? Why do you text somebody? Why do you email? Why do you post something on your Facebook? Why do we communicate? We communicate first and foremost to change the behavior. Like you want to tell somebody, hey, you want to change for the better. You should do this and that. Second, we communicate to get action. You want to get something done. You want to get somebody to take out the trash. You want to um, get somebody do your assignment for you or you want to make your parents give you some allowances for some night out with friends and so on. We also communicate to ensure understanding, like to make sure that there was no miscommunication at all. Like you want to ask somebody, is that clear enough for you? Is the instruction clear enough for you? Did you understand me? Did you understand the, in the, the instruction? And we also communicate to persuade. Like advertisements on TV and radio do this purpose. Do communicate for this purpose. Like they want to um, make advertisements for a particular product to persuade us, the audience, to buy or patronize their products or services. And the last one is to get and give information. So communication, after all, is the exchange or transmission of information from one person to another. So what then is purposive communication? This is, after all, the title of our course or subject. So purposive communication class is an intentional communication that happens within the bounds of specific context. It is a communication applied in a specific setting or environment or scene or social relations and culture. So... There's a specific context. And what is context? Context affects the process of sending and receiving of messages, its semantics or meanings, the choice of channels, words, and methods of delivery. Basically, context refers to a specific situation where the communication occurs. So context can include can include setting or environment. So does the communication take place in within your family, in your school, or in the workplace, or religious communities? Context can also include social relationships. It's different when we communicate with friends. We can take we can talk gay lingo with friends, but we cannot do that with our boss or um, those in the higher ups or those with a higher rank. Scenes which include place, time, and occasion. So our communication also needs to be flexible in a way that when we are at a specific place or time or occasion, it can be a business meeting, it can be a job interview, it can just be a lunch out with friends, and so on. Contacts also include a culture. Or a particular person or culture of a person you are talking with. So his or her history, their traditions, their beliefs in their country, their norms and values. So those are included in the cultural context of communication. And we will be learning all of that as we go through the semester. Communication involves three components. First, we have the verbal messages. This refers to the words we choose. Second, we have the nonverbal messages, which includes our body movements. And the third one is the 
paraverbal messages or the para language, it's basically how we say what we say. So let's talk about all of those three components of communication. First, the verbal. Verbal communication is further divided into written or oral communication. Verbal communication basically includes like communicating with words. So com you communicate with words when you talk. You communicate with words when you write down, like write a note or write a chat or write an email. So verbal communication can be oral or written. So oral communication refers to the spoken words in the communication process. So example of this particular type of verbal communication includes being in symposiums, in seminars, in a business meeting, for example, or talking to your friend over the phone, or even video chatting. Or this, this type of communication, I mean communication scenario where I'm talking to you, we're having our online video lecture so this is an example of oral communication. And the second one would be the written communication. So when we do use words in writing, so that is an example of written verbal communication. So this includes writing a text, for example, or typing a text to be sent to your uh, friends or your girlfriends or your boyfriends um, writing messages on messenger or writing an email or writing a love letter or writing a business correspondence for the organization so these are examples of written communication basically communication experts um, assign percentages for the total communication that we do daily. So they're into researching how much do how much do we communicate in terms of verbal, nonverbal, or body language. And if I ask you that, how much, how many percentage of verbal communication do you do daily? How much of it is nonverbal? How much of it is paralanguage? This is how experts divide the pie. So it's 7% verbal. Take note, it's only 7%. Out of all, the 100%, it's only less than 10%. 7% is verbal. 38% is vocal, or that's paralanguage while more than half, that's 55%, is allotted to nonverbal or body language. So imagine that. Even without saying anything, you are still communicating. So nonverbal communication is the sending and receiving of wordless messages, such as gestures or your body language. A simple wink of the eye is communication already. A smile, a wave of your hand, that's... Part, all part of nonverbal communication, and we will be learning more of that in here. So, what are the different types of nonverbal communication? We have seven of them. So, first, we have kinesics, referring to the language of the body. We have haptics, referring to the language of touch. Proxemics refers to the language of space. Chronemics refers to the language of time. Olfactics refers to the language of smell. Artifactual refers to the language of objects and of course, physical appearance, like how you package yourself physically, which includes all your clothes and so on. So we will be discussing each one of them. So first, we have kinesics, which again refers to the study of communicative dimensions of facial and bodily movements so kinesics and there are five subcategories of kinesics first we have 
the emblems the emblems are direct replacement for words they are gestures that are direct replacement for words they include a thumbs up sign or a thumbs down sign or the wave of your hand that basically says hi or hello or even goodbye so it's a direct replacement for words you don't have to say anything but the thumbs up sign is enough to get your message across so that's emblem illustrators on the other hand are movements that illustrate or emphasize your ideas like you may say this it's it is so tiny it was like this it was so little or it was this big and you make gestures with your hand to show how big it is so those are illustrators next are affect displays Affect displays are facial expressions that communicate your feelings or emotions. So a smile, a frown, an angry face, a scared face, like even without saying it, like early in the morning when you go to school, your friend will ask you, hey, what's the good news? You seem so happy. So you see, you haven't said anything yet, but basing on your look, basing on your facial expression, your friend can al already tell that you're happy. So she wants you to tell her about a good news. Or if on the other hand, you look so sad, your friend is probably going to ask you, hey, is there a problem? Can I, can I do anything to help? So that's one concerned friend right there. The next one are regulators. They are movements or actions that regulate conversation. So they include eye contact, like when you look at a person straight in the eye, if you're talking to that person, or if on the other hand, like if his eye movements also, like if he's looking at his watch instead of, of looking at you while conversing, so that also communicates something, right? or a top of your feet or yeah that those includes regulators and the last one would be adapters adapters are actions that release physical or emotional tension when someone is anxious what do you do when you're nervous what do you do when you're tense so some people would like twist their hair like that or they may uh, bite their fingertips, they bite their, their nails, or they may crunch their knuckles to show they are scared, or they may like keep on touching the wire or their ID when they're scared. So those are examples of adapters. So again, those are the five subcategories of kinesics. Again, we have emblems, illustrators, effect displays, regulators, and adapters. Next would be haptics, which refers to the language of touch as a means of nonverbal communication. So touch is the most primitive form of communication. When we were babies, everybody wants to hug us or carry us or kiss us. That number of people grows lesser and lesser as we age right you cannot expect a stranger to just like kiss you and 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 hug you right that would be um acts of lasciviousness or that would be considered as sexual harassment so only very few people family and close friends perhaps are allowed or these are the people that you allow to kiss you or hug you or get touchy-touchy with you, right? Okay, so that is haptics, the language of touch. Next would be proxemics, which refers to the language of space, the study of spatial communication and how we use it. Okay, so the bigger your personal space is that talks about your status in life, the smaller it is, that also means something about your status in life so when we talk of proxemics there are four space zones first is the intimate which is like 6 to 18 inches these are for people who are who you are intimate with your family members those you sleep with at night 
um, or very close friends, like someone you are comfortable touching and hugging every time. So you use that space for them. The personal space is 18 inches to 4 feet. This is now this now includes strangers like you want to ask information from the security guard for example. This is the space zone that you use. Social zone is 4 to 12 feet. While public zone and this is most commonly used for public Communication, the speaker is right there at the podium or the stage and he is 12 to 25 feet away from his or her audience. So that's public zone, that's 12 to 25 feet. So again, when we talk of proxemics, the language of space, the four space zones are intimate, personal, social, and public zone. The next one is chronemics, which refers to the language of time. So it is a study of the use of time to nonverbal or in nonverbal communication. The way that one perceives and values time, structures time, and reacts to time frames communication. So you are either monochromatic or polychromatic or whether you use time formally or informally. Chronemic, I mean, monochromatic means a strict adherence to time. So when you say 7 a.m., that means 7 a.m. on the dot. If you say polychromatic, that means Filipino time, for example. Like you say the program starts at 6 p.m. and it actually starts like at 7 30 or later when you say assembly time is 7 a.m so the bus leaves at 8 a.m everybody arrives at 7 30 or 8 and then the bus actually gets to leave at 9 a.m or later that's filipino time we call it polychromatic so again when we talk about chronemics it's either monochromatic, meaning strict adherence to time, or polychromatic, which means um, it's, they're not really strict in adhering to a specific time. It's like flexible, like again, Filipino time. So that is chronemics. Next will be olfactics. Olfactics refers to the language of smell. How do you smell right now, class? Can you smell yourself? Do you smell pleasant or do you smell any like body odor or something? So I hope not. Certain scents reminds us of some pleasant or unpleasant memories like um, efficacent oil, for example. You smell the scent of efficacent oil and it reminds you of your grandmother for example and it suddenly makes you miss her right or a specific scent of a perfume and it reminds you of your boyfriend or your girlfriend uh, or the smell of food and how it elicits beautiful memories of home of your mother's cooking so again that is olfactics so again the language of smell and sense next would be artifactual which refers to the language of objects it's nonverbal communication through object language so material possessions display of artifacts or objects and physical appearance of people all make silent statements about your lifestyle so the things that you carry with you what are these things? Your cell phones, for example, your mobile phones, what model you're using, and what's the brand or, or something. Um, your laptop, your laptops that you're using, or it can be your accessories that you're wearing, like your earrings or your watch, the type of watch that you're, that you're using. All these things communicate about you. Like a guy walks in a restaurant, for example, 
holding car keys. What does that mean? Does a guy own a car or is he just a driver? <laughs> okay, so that is artifactual, again, the language of objects. And of course, the last but not the least, certainly not the least, is physical appearance. This refers to your overall look, the type of clothes you wear, how you do your face, how you do your hair, how you do your makeup, and all of that. That refers to physical appearance. Now, please do not underestimate the power of your physical appearance, the power of how your appearance affects people's perception of you. Some people can be so judgmental. Some people can say, I, that person is looks like an addict. That person looks like a genius. That, that person looks very nerdy. Mind you, that's like the general. People can be judgmental in the sense that even before you say your first hi or hello, even before you utter your first words, people already form some kind of judgment towards you just by how you package yourself, just by how you look. So that's very important. Before you step out of your house to go anywhere, make sure to ask yourself when you look at yourself in the mirror, Am I presenting myself the best way I could today? Am I wearing the right clothes for the occasion that I am going to? Am I um, wearing a smile? Am I doing my hair nicely and all? So make sure to look and present yourself the best way you could. So that's physical appearance. So again, to sum it up, the nonverbal communications include kinesics, olfactics, haptics, chronemics, proxemics, artifactual, and physical appearance. They all do 55% of the total communication that we communicate, that we do. And this is like the 38%, the paralanguage. Here, what is para language? The term para language is a combination of two words, para, which means like, and language, which means mode of communication. So para language literally means like language. So in short, para language or paralinguistics refers to how we say what we say. So this basically covers our intonation, our pitch, our volume, our rate, our voice quality, and all, and how they communicate more, actually, than the words that we speak. So when we say paralanguage, this covers the five. First, we have vocal quality, we have volume, tempo, pitch, juncture, and or pauses. So quality is the vocal characteristics that distinguish one's voice from another. So we all have a unique voice. Some, there are some people whom you can identify just by listening to their voice. You haven't seen a person yet, but you hear his or her voice, you would know that this person is in the room, right? Because of his voice, the vocal quality. Some people's voice can be harsh. Some people can be pleasant to the ears, very soothing to the ears. You would like to listen to this speaker's voice. It's very calming and soothing to listen. Some women's voice sound that of a male's voice, you know, parang masculine ang voice. So that's vocal quality. Volume refers to the loudness or softness of, this, of that voice. Some people can be so loud, like they're just talking to one person and yet it seems like they're talking to the entire barangay. And some can be really, really soft-spoken. You have to strain your ears to listen to that person talk. Tempo, on the other hand, or rate, refers to the number of words which you speak per minute. The normal rate is 120 to 150 words per minute. So you need to adjust your tempo according to some situations, like 
radio or TV broadcasters generally talk faster than normal con- the normal conversation. They do that not only to save on the airtime, but also to level up their credibility. They are perceived to be more credible if they talk faster than normal. So that's tempo and rate. Next is pitch, which refers to the number of vibrations per second of your voice, the highness or lowness of your um, yeah, your voice. And the last one is juncture or pauses. So juncture basically refers to, it's a short silence flanked by words, a pause in speaking that lets the listener reflect on the message and digest it accordingly. So those expert speakers, they use pause, they use this juncture for, to give more drama to their speech. Like they want the audience to digest what they have just said before they proceed to the next point. Some also pause because they forgot their next line, right? While you also need to be sensitive of like when you ask questions to a certain person and they pause before talking before saying anything it may mean that they're thinking what they're going to say or they may it may mean that they're unsure of of what they're going to say right so that's juncture or pause so basically those are the five para language or paralinguistic elements that again covers 38 percent of the total communication that we do so again expert communicators when they divide a the pie they assign only like five percent seven percent um to verbal communication 55 percent to um bodily movements or nonverbal communication while the 38% goes to paralinguistic elements so when you communicate it basically is like a package of your words of how you say your words and the gestures your bodily movements your postures your facial expression that accompany those words so make sure you get all of these elements in sync with each other so there would be no miscommunication no misunderstanding that will happen that way you become a good communicator so that ends our lecture on communication and what is communication and all the three components of communication be updated with your learning management system for assignments, supplementary notes, and see you on the next video. Thank you.